Hello, and thank you very much for joining us for our latest World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinar. You are very kindly joining us by Zoom. It's great you have. You can take part in our poll question, just one poll question tonight, but you can also put all of your questions through the Q&A function. I'll explain that in a minute. But especially for Zoom followers, you'll also be able to upvote any questions that you see when we get to the Q&A session. So now it's great to see our Facebook Live followers join us for the latest of our World Horse Welfare Wednesday webinars, which tonight is all about can a stable horse be a happy horse? Now, we recognise that it is a, a quite a divisive issue, and that's certainly reflected in the Facebook posts we've already received. Um, but as in any care of our horses and their management, there is often no clear cut answer, especially when we consider that all horses are different. They're all individuals. And what might work for one might not work for another. But it is a divisive and emotive topic. So we have brought out the heavy guns. And so tonight or today we have I'm delighted to have Professor Andrew McLean. It is six minute, one minute past six, where in the morning for Andrew, he says he's normally an early bird, but uh, I'm especially grateful to Andrew to, for joining us so early in the morning um, on uh, from Australia, but also then assistant professor from uh, University of Nottingham, Brad Hill, and also our very own Eileen Gillen, who's our centre manager for our Scottish Rehabilitation, a uh, Rescue and Rehabilitation Centre. Um, Andrew is here for his second webinar. Brad is here for his second webinar. Eileen is here for her third webinar, the third, the first person who's been here th three times. Um, you, you must do it very badly or very well, Eileen. I, I will find out shortly <laughs> which one that is. I know it, it's the latter. So thank you very much. What we're going to do tonight is Andrew is going to present for around 25 to 30 minutes. Then we've got a few structured questions that we're going to share around with Brad, Eileen and Andrew. And then it's very much open to you. So we do really want this to be an interactive session. So if you're joining us by Zoom, you can use the chat function to chat amongst yourselves. But if you've got a, a question you'd like to ask the team, then please put it in the Q&A function. If you're joining us by Facebook, then please, for any questions you have, put them in the comments function. And for those who are on Zoom, as I mentioned earlier, you'll be able to upvote your questions, um, a question if, if you like, like it, rather than having to type your own question. And of course, if you're joining us by Facebook Live, do, shoot, do share the live video as well. Now, tonight's webinar and all of the webinars we've done since June 2020 are available on our YouTube education channel. We are carrying on our webinars until the end of April. We'll have a gap over the summer and we'll recommence them um, in the autumn. So if you've got anything you would like us to cover in the future webinar, then please do email us on education at worldforcewelfare.org. And our next webinar is going to be on the 23rd of March. And that is No Gut, No Horse. Why Gut Bugs Are Essential for optimum health and behaviour. And that's on the 23rd of March. And we'll be, I'm delighted that we'll be joined by Amber Batson and Joe Hockenhull for that webinar in two weeks' time. And we've put up a, um, an opportunity for you to sign up to that straight away. So now I'm going to share my screen, uh, which I couldn't do last time if you were here. Um, so here, can a stable horse truly be a happy horse? Um, and so we just want to start off by mentioning the, the, the terrible goings on in, in Ukraine right now. And um, for those of you who are joining from the UK, I just wanted to let you know that today, through British Equestrian, we have launched um, a, a, an emergency appeal for to support the Ukrainian equestrian sector for the horses, grooms and owners who are having such a desperate time at the moment. We can only hope and pray that the news will become more positive um, very, very soon, but it's certainly a very desperate situation at the moment. If you would like to donate, um, Basil has just put a link in to that, um, and anything you can give, we'd be so grateful for. Um, so tonight, can a stable horse truly be a happy horse? We've gone just for two responses, yes or no. We initially thought would have sort of a number of different variations between yes and no, but we just thought, on balance, do you think a stable horse 
can truly be a happy horse. And just, just give us your, there's no right or wrong answer here. And generally go with your gut feel and then we'll be able to reflect on that during the Q and A. So whilst you're um, uh, actually um, going to reflect on that, I'm going to introduce you to um, our keynote presenter, which is Andrew McLean, who many of you will know from uh, his, his previous um, webinar and from his previous work with the in, in equestrian sector. He describes himself actually as not being a horseman. Um, and uh, actually he, he, he has a great love of elephants. Um, and he was telling us just now that he grew up on an island um, and he had a pet seal. So you're seeing a very different flavour to Andrew tonight. Uh, he did also tell us some very disturbing stories about tiger snakes, but we'll probably leave that for another day. But uh, Andrew is hugely well respected in the, in the sector, was a previous uh, president of the International Society for Equitation Science. So it is really, really well qualified to give us his insights and understanding onto whether a stabled horse can be a happy horse. So before I hand over to Andrew, I would just like Basil to give us the answer to the poll. I haven't given you long to talk about. So there you go. Quite an even, just a, that's more even than I thought it would be. A third of you, just over, think a, a, a stable horse, can a stable horse truly be a happy horse? A third of you think yes, just under two thirds of you think no. It'll be maybe interesting if we did that at the end of the session. So Andrew, with that introduction, I'm delighted to turn off my sharing and hand over to you at six minutes past six in the morning, Australia time. Thank you very much. And uh, is my screen up? Um, Not yet. Do I share it again? Um, you need to share it again, yes. Okay. That's How's coming. that? Is that? That's coming through. Dead on. We're good to go. So, okay. Well, I should really start at the start. I must say, I, I really was very excited about this. So I could hardly sleep this morning, even though I had to get up early, because this topic is a really fascinating one that we can spend hours sitting around a cup of coffee or a glass of wine discussing. It is one of those areas that is so hard to know because it's, sorry, i just move that on now. It's so, so fraught with anthropomorphism. How do we even know that another person is happy and, and what is happiness? So they're the sorts of things I want to just briefly explore to help us in this, uh, in, the, in this discussion. There's no right or wrong answer, as Rolly said. We really, we really don't know, and much of it relates to um, how we perceive happiness anyway. But uh, there are quite a few interesting uh, elements to this discussion that I wanted to talk about. Um, you know, as I said, it's hard to directly see happiness in, in any, anyone, let alone in a horse. And we can look for uh, such things as positive effect um, and other uh, sort of experimental approaches to happiness in horses. But even then, it's, um, it, it can be quite subjective. It's also relative when you think about it. I remember reading a book years ago, uh, The Gulag Archipelago by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, where it described a, a prisoner who was locked in a prison for many years and nothing changed. The same kind of meal came in through the little trap door every day. Then one day, the prisoner flung into the prison cell a piece of chewing gum, and that was the happiest, the happiest moment for that prisoner. And it, 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 it just speaks to the relativity of happiness, certainly from the human point of view. When we think about happiness, how do we uh, understand it in animals in terms of higher mental abilities? Do you, do you need to have a level in, of intelligence to be very happy, to be euphoric um, at the other end of the scale? There's, um, you know, the worst things that humans could do, you know, uh, uh, revenge and hatred and all of those sorts of things that we even see happening sadly now. Um, but those sorts of the, the things are, are all part of this discussion. And then there is the, there are the narratives that we've uh, that we've 
uh, given to the horse and describe the horse uh, through those lenses. Narratives, you know, the loyal horse, the horse that we used in war, the horse that was a, a willing uh, horse uh, with a great work ethic, um, the horse in sport, how we uh, people talk about partnership. So people talk about horses as, on the one hand, as if they're, as if they're persons and they have personhood. But then on the other hand, they also, we also talk about horses as objects in the sense that we can own them and we can sell them. But that's a little bit aside. I also wanted to talk or to mention that the one thing that has changed in the domestication of horses in the last five or 6,000 years is habituation in terms of learning uh, processes, I mean, not in morphology, but in learning processes, operant conditioning and the abilities to uh, learn through operant and classical conditioning probably haven't changed. I don't think a horse is any worse or better than a zebra um, or any other animal because we've used those learning abilities in our, um, in our various uses of the horse. But the one thing that has changed is habituation for sure. Um, horses, are, they adapt so easily, they become used to things so easily uh, in most cases, some of them don't because we've reintroduced uh, very flighty blood into some breeds like thoroughbreds for racing and even these days into warm bloods for dressage to give them more pizzazz. So there are elements of flight response that we've reincorporated back into the um, horse, uh, domestic horse genome. But habituation is generally um, a broad truth about the modern horse. And so in doing so, um, that is an argument that horses are, could be happy enough in a stable. It's quite unlikely that a zebra would ever be happy in a stable, but somehow we've selectively bred horses to, uh, to, to be uh, in, all, in all respects and from a, a point of view of visibility to appear to be happy, but there's much more to it than that. And that's where I want to go now, I think we do need to explore higher mental abilities because if you look first of all at that diagram at the bottom, that's what I was hinting to before. Where does the horse sit in that? You know, the, both ends of the scale, the hu a human being can be, you know, we can derive immense pleasure, we can be euphoric, but at the other end, we can be absolutely miserable and um, revengeful and, and, and hateful. They're probably elaborations of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in humans. Our ability in that area that you see in the top diagram of the brain, that top part, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is unique in human beings, in, in certainly histologically uh, unique in that these cells are very dense and granular. Um, and that means they have uh, strong nuclei and large nuclei within a cell usually means that the cell does a lot, and they certainly do. Our brains require so much more energy than any other tissue, uh, 10 times more energy than any other tissue in the body, including the heart. So, you know, it does a lot, and it's our biggest weakness, uh, our biggest strength, our biggest enemy. You know, it, it enables us to be massively uh, depressed, um, but it also gives us... Uh, great pleasure. It enables us to plan ahead and to think ahead and to imagine, to estimate time. We forget about that. When we talk about horses, often the language we use is implies that they do have a strong dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. You know, we talk about horses wishing and wanting and hoping and all of those things, and even some abstract kind of concepts, which are highly unlikely to be there in a horse. A horse is much more stimulus bound. It, it, it really is what it is in this moment, which is really a great way to be. You know, people pay a fortune uh, to go for a Zen uh, to, to learn how to live in the moment and, and mindfulness and all of those things. It's not easy for us to do it, but the horse is a master at that. In terms of other aspects of the, door, of the prefrontal cortex, the orbitofrontal cortex, by the way, is the area associated with positive and negative affective states. In other words, the horse's 
uh, feeling of optimism and pessimism, which is seemingly anthropomorphic, but actually what it means is the horses, if it's pe pessimistic, it's likely to not try new responses because the last ones didn't work. And that can be something that we can engender in the horse through mistakes in training. So what I'm driving at slowly is that the things that we do to horses can really very much influence whether they're going to be happy enough in the stable. The stable itself may be, it's certainly something that we can improve, but it may not be the biggest problem. In fact, I, I think it's not. Um, so when we talk about this uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we, where we do all of our thinking and elaboration, and the fact that the horse has either very limited or no dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, he's really just living in the moment. And that's why horses have not a very good recall memory, but an excellent recognition memory. So the difference between those two is that the horse has this vast memory of whatever his world is, you know, in the field or um, in, the, in the wild state of everything that's in, in the landscape. And that is, that is a really truly remarkable memory, but he doesn't necessarily have the ability to just suddenly recall without the stimulus being present. So for example, if you hit a horse with a whip and then uh, you approach him with the whip behind your back, he doesn't immediately uh, see that that's a problem, unless, of course, he has made that classically conditioned connection of you with the whip, and then he will, of course. But what I'm meaning is that without seeing the stimulus, the horse is not likely to show the behavior, which is a really great way to live, if you think, if you think about it. You know, it'd be nice if we were all a bit like that. So all of these um, words are really uh, inappropriate for the horse, the, the way we describe them, that you know he wishes and hopes and believes, and some people say he feels guilty, and even being naughty, that implies that he has a concept of the behavior he should be doing, but he's not. There are much better ways of understanding this, and most of it's about looking in the mirror, about what has happened to the horse, um, what, is he confused, is he clear on all of his signals and aids that we give the horse, and that's pretty much been my life. Um, moving on, also when we talk about happiness and we talk about the, uh, the influence of the brain, the influence of language really makes a big difference too. Uh, if we, in humans, we have this elaborate language, which is very much um, specific to our, our, our own cultures. But for other animals, it's not so much like that. And so we talk about uh, phatic expressions and phonemic language. And I think we need to really recognize that, that often we impose this on animals that simply don't have it. So in biology and anthropology, we, we separate non-human communication systems into one of four models. So animals like horses have a fairly fine repertory of of calls. So a horse that whinnies in Australia or UK will be understood in, uh, in Germany. Um, other animals have a continuous analog system that is quite, system, uh, quite simple, but also very interestingly uh, effective, where it's a continuous analog system that registers magnitude, such as uh, bees have really perfected this, and other insects as well, and some other invertebrates or a series of random variations on the theme like bird calls where they, uh, their memory is also integrated into their communication systems. And this can also be very seemingly cultural where certain birds do certain types of calls. And then there's the encultured communication where a few species like orcas and great apes have very flexible communication systems which are the precursor to, to human language. So, to describe uh, equine communication as language is probably misleading given the complexities of human symbolic uh, language. And that helps us understand something about where the horse may fit in in the happiness scale. In terms of sentience though, regardless, horses are, 
are of course very sentient animals and you don't need prospective memory to be sentient. Uh, certainly just living in the moment like the horse does is a marvelous way to uh, experience the world uh, on a moment to moment basis. Of course, I'm not disregarding the fact that horses can be shut down by previous training, but it's not so much the recalling of memory that causes those feelings of or learned helplessness to arise. It's much more the uh, miswiring that happens as a result of that through the uh, suffering. So sentience is all about subjective experiences and feelings and moods and uh, emotions uh, and all those things that impact suffering. It's influenced by such things as arousal, you know, how aroused the horse is. Arousal is a very complex thing. It's not as simple as just on and off or parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. It's very much um, modulated um, in the sense that there can be an element of parasympathetic and many elements of parasympathetic vagal tone, which is what polyvagal theory is about. Um, it's not necessarily just one or the other. And all the things, all the ex emotional experiences we feel, grief and rage, um, lust, all of those things have different kinds of arousal signatures in the horse's endocrine system and nervous system. I mentioned affective states, positive and negative affective states. That's the feelings that in the horse of optimism or, or, or pessimism. Uh, attachment's really important. Horses are very social beings and not being attached uh, and being isolated is a problem, uh, a really big problem for the horse. And also reinforcement history. What is, the, what is the horse's history in its interactions with people? And this is a really important element because horses have evolved to be horses and they're perfectly evolved to live in the kind of landscape where they evolve. evolve but they're not so perfectly evolved. It hasn't been long enough and there's been no uh, environmentally selective pressure or little environmental selective pressure for horses to learn all the complex signals that we do with horses in various horse sports. So that's a big one, that reinforcement history. So looking at the happy horse, it, got, it has really got so much to do with enabling the horse to access the fundamental needs. So back to this diagram that I've shown you a number of times. This, uh, on the right hand side, we have the 2025 domains model of animal welfare, where we've now introduced into that model uh, behavioral interactions because of their importance. And that's one of the reasons I became involved in that project is because we cannot really look at uh, a model of animal welfare and exclude the effect of what humans do to horses, what humans do to dogs and what we do to elephants and other animals. Um, it has a dramatic effect on their mental state. So all of these things, these four things, these four slabs, they feed into the mental state of the animal and give it feelings of positive or negative effect. And on the left-hand side, I've also uh, made a division between what I call care and welfare. Uh, it's a kind of arbitrary division, but it's worth thinking about that in the care element below, we, have all, we take care of all of the horse's physiological and, and veterinary needs. You know, the horse has good shelter and um, he feels safe and he has adequate nutrition and all of those things. They're, 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 they're things that we can do and, and we mostly do do in, in good animal husbandry. But the new area, what we forget to do and what we don't take enough notice of, are these four pillars above that dotted line of, of welfare. So communication and mental stimulation is important. I'll talk a bit about mental stimulation in a second, but communication again is the reinforcement strategies that we use to train horses. In what cues do we use? Are these clear to the horse? Can he discriminate them easily? Do we often offer two cues at once? Is the horse held in a coercive pressure from the bit or the spur relentlessly. 
Those are the sorts of questions that are important for the horse's welfare. Foraging is the, the horse doesn't just want to eat uh, high fiber, low carb hay for a certain amount of time. He needs to, it's a drive, it's a mental drive. He's wired to do it. And in the absence of that, we see stereotypical behaviors such as uh, wind sucking and, um, and crib biting and other oral behaviors. The horse also has a strong need for movement and exercise. And so that's why we see when we lock them up and we then we let them out, we often see them cavorting and leaping in what we think is, you know, joie de vivre, and possibly it is, but it's also what we call post-inhibitory rebound because the horse has this urge to move and is not wired to be, to be locked up. But it's probably not a great imposition on the horse uh, by that uh, factor. Uh, when we see post-inhibitory rebound in a, in a stable horse, that seems to get it out of the road quite quickly. And people lunge horses for the same kind of reason. But the fourth pillar, that one of social behavior is absolutely fundamental. As I keep saying, horses are hyper-social animals like humans. And their social behavior and their social needs are mediated by touch, not just by seeing, by touch. And that's where stabling comes in and how we design stables of the future. And that's where I want to go to because it's such a valuable area to uh, look at. But before I do, um, sorry, that I forgot I expanded that. Before I look at how, um, the stabling itself, I want to also just show you a couple of things. There's some re interesting research that's oh, it's nearly 20 years old from the University of Lincoln, showing that providing a mirror in a stable can really help. Because horses are stimulus bound animals, it can really help a horse in the same way it can help a budgerigar or any other animal uh, to have uh, a mirror, just because they can see what seems to be a conspecific. And this is a mirror we have in, our, that's in my uh, tie up area. And the horses do use it. I have, have to clean it constantly because they're all sniffing it and blowing um, uh, chaff and oats and things all over it. And also at the provision for enrichment of things like toys, they can really help just to give the horse some other mental stimulation in an enclosed environment. But now on to stabling itself. Some of you may recall that um, I'd been working with uh, through Lisa, Lisa Ashton uh, with the Manchester Police. And we had been working for years on their training and really their training was going so well. I said to them, look, there's only one thing else that I think that needs to be done and that is managing horses differently. Uh, it's a very big police force. What about if we just did an experiment? Because I know it will work. I've seen it work before uh, with single horses in small uh, experimental designs, um, if we just remove the bars. And they came back and said, we'll remove all the bars in all the stables. And that's what they did. And so there was a little bit of ruckus in the first week, but they reported so many great things that the horses were much quieter in the stable after that. And the horses spent a lot of time touching each other. And they also um, were braver out on patrol. And one of my... Uh, Pupils uh, works for a big train of Gay Waterhouse in Australia, and he's telling me that uh, in some of the old stables, the bricks have fallen out. And the first thing that horses will do after work in those stables is immediately go to touch and, uh, and, and sniff, actively touch and sniff another horse before they even go to water and before they even go to feed. So strong is the need for social behavior. And so other people have done this. And so there are various sorts of things that you can do in stables to give the horse more access to social partners. I think it's essential. And as I've said, I'd rather, if I were a dressage judge and I saw a bite or two, a bite mark or two on a horse's neck, I wouldn't be marking it down and thinking badly. I would be thinking, well, that horse has a, has a much happier life because that is what they need. I don't think stabling is anywhere near so bad if they can touch each other. 
but seeing is just not enough because we do know that they are very touch animals. In the base of the neck of the horse, there's a plexus of nerves that directly connect to the vagal nerve. And that's why horses groom each other there. And that's why horses are the only species that we know of where heart rate lowers around 10 beats per minute when they groom each other there at the base of the neck. So it is, it's fundamentally important. And so one of my friends, an old friend from event, my eventing days, Luke Jones, is an equine architect, our, our top equine architect in Australia, when many people would say. And Luke's got some very interesting ideas about the future of stabling. And um, these two pictures are just the, you know, the standard stable. The one on the left is just the, his architectural drawing of the um, standard stable in the old days where horses sometimes couldn't even see each other. And even at one day events in Australia, and I'm sure it's true elsewhere in the world, when stabling is provided in some places, horses cannot see each other at all. And that is not a great way to start uh, for a horse to feel any positive effect about being away from home or being at a competition. And of course, on the right-hand side, people, it's normal to put bars and people feel comfortable when they have this stable and they'll put gold baubles on the top of the stable and lovely hay. And for many people, that is a happy horse because he's got this beautiful stable that cost a fortune and he's got ample bedding and it's nice and dry and clean and all of those good things, which, which is true, but whether it makes him happy or not is really questionable. So what we can do, and there's again a Luke's drawings, is we can design stables where we can give them access if needed. If we can't do that because we need to isolate the horse more for whatever reason, um, we can close the door in that top left diagram or leave it open. Or we can move into this kind of stabling where we give horses full access to the horse next door. And I think that's really the future. Uh, there are so many possible designs of this, but that's where we should be looking and we would see much happier horses. And we have to think if we're involved in horse sports or even leisure and our horses are shying out when we're training, it's very common for 99% of the horse population to immediately think, well, that's because he's scared of, you know, cats or agapanthus or blowing plastic bags that flow in the wind. But it may very well be to do with deeper reasons that the, there are big holes in the horse's basic life. And this is one big hole. Another kind of um, design is, um, you know, much more beautiful. Um, we can do all sorts of things. We can also... Uh, and this was brought up at a German, uh, I, th I think a German presentation at an ISIS conference years ago for housing stallions, where we give them enough room to um, move their head all the way up and down, but not there, of course, they can't squeeze through. And um, so this is a possibility. These are some of Luke's uh, putting into practice those drawings. And you can see they're really quite, they can be very attractive and quite expensive, but they don't need to be expensive just to give the horse access. You can see with these, uh, with these stables that there is even, there's access on the sidebars as well. And so there's another, another picture of that. And so I want to, I think we will make a really big change to horses' lives if we, if we do need to stable them by giving them more access to um, other horses. And th there are many ways to do this. Leastwise, even a mirror will provide that. One of the, uh, the studies that was published about mirrors, incidentally, showed that it had a, a, a highly significant, uh, there was a highly significant reduction in uh, weaving and nodding in horses that had mirrors in their stables. And of course, when you do uh, have a mirror made, it's best, of course, to use plastics rather than glass so it doesn't shatter. 
But um, it's also very good, incidentally, for horses that have traveling problems is to provide a mirror. That I've seen that many times calm horses down um, in, uh, with horses that have a lot of stress in traveling. And that's it. So thank you very much. I um, think I'm pretty much on time for once. <laughs> I know I could listen to you for a long time more. So thank you very much. You are dead. Yeah, I think you're dead on time. Um, and that was superb. God, there's lo lots, lots of food for thought. So um, thank you so much for that. Um, and it's wonderful, actually. I've just been looking at, um, we always ask where people are from. And I think we might have the most international audience we've ever had before. We certainly cover the four nations of the United Kingdom from Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and England, literally from John O'Groats to Land's End. Um, across Europe, we have Sweden, Croatia, France, Slovakia, Netherlands, Italy, Switzerland. From the Middle East, United Arab Emirates. From the Americas, Canada, USA, Colombia, Brazil and also from Australia. And I'd have to say a shout out to Julie from Melbourne and Australia, Julie Fiedler, uh, who was with me at a presentation, uh, Australia's yesterday for me and everyone else in Europe uh, earlier today. Uh, so she's got a, a good endurance going there. So thank you, Julie, for joining us. And Andrew, thank you for that. Lots of questions, um, but maybe not enough questions. Uh, so please do remember, if you're on Facebook, put your comments on the, uh, put your questions on the comments function. And if you're on Zoom, please add the questions to the Q&A. We, we've got a few, but maybe not enough at the moment. Um, and I know that there'll be plenty of questions out there. But what I'd love to do now is I, I just need to share my screen very quickly again. Um, and there we go. And uh, share that. And um, just to introduce our other two panellists. So some of you will, will uh, many of you will know uh, uh, Brad Hill, but, um, assistant professor uh, at um, uh, Nottingham Vet School. Brad was very helpful. We put on a, a series of uh, mental well-being webinars last summer, summer 2021, and University of Nottingham, and especially Brad, was, was hugely helpful in bringing uh, together, helping us bring together that series, which are all available on our YouTube channel. Um, he is an equine vet with considerable experience, both in a referral hospital, but also out on ambulatory practice. And so it's great to have Brad with us. Um, a quirky fact, you might, I love this, Brad has two dogs. Well, currently has two dogs. Um, one is a whippet, I love whippets, called Stanley, and a sausage dog called Reggie. And when he was in clinical practice, his dogs locked him out of the car, blocking the gateway to the yard. And if that wasn't bad enough, they then proceeded to eat the cash a previous client had paid mm. him with. Don't we just love dogs nearly as much as we love our, our, our horses? So, Brad, it's great to have you with us tonight. And also then to be joined by Eileen, Eileen Gillen, um, who is the our centre manager for our Scottish uh, Rescue and Rehoming Centre uh, in Aberdeenshire. Uh, Eileen, you know, I would imagine Eileen as a, like the TARDIS in Doctor Who, because she has worked for World Horse Welfare for 32 years. Uh, and before that, she had a considerable career within uh, the, the equestrian world as well, um, in riding to a very high level. So she is hugely experienced. And Eileen always, uh, given that previous experience, she always reminds me of Eddie Murphy from the film Beverly Hills Cop. Do you remember he was a policeman and Eddie Murphy would always say that uh, I, I didn't always used to be a cop, implying he had a, a, a bit of a different past. And Eileen says, well, before I joined World Horse Welfare, X, Y, and Z. So she's always reminded me of the film uh, Beverly Hills Cop, excellent film to watch if you haven't seen it. So now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna welcome Andrew, Eileen, and Brad to the, to the virtual table. And we're going to start with a few structured Q and A's, and then we'll move it out to. Um, oh, look, I, I chastise you for not giving us enough questions, and suddenly there's a mountain of them. So keep them coming, and do remember, if you're on Zoom, um, upvote those questions if, if there's any ones that you really like there. So, Brad, I'll turn to you first. We talked a lot. It's in the title. Uh, Andrew has talked to us a lot about the happy horse. The FEI talks about 
a happy athlete. But equally, um, we, we're always quite cautious not to anthropomorphize our horses, not to think of horses as humans. And actually, Andrew talks about that, you know, about the dangers of think, talking about sort of how horses talk, their, their language. Do you think there is a danger um, of g giving sort of a misunderstanding if we describe horses as happy or unhappy? Yeah, I think that's a really tough question, really. Um, I think if we asked anyone really what what their definition of happy is, we'd probably get a different answer, and that that may not be anything to do with horses. So um, that probably is the the first um, challenge is is what is being happy. But certainly um, being in practice, or or even now not being in clinical practice, but teaching at uh, University of Nottingham, I still get videos of uh, horses sent to me saying look, you know, look how happy he is. And, and clients or horse owners will often make that judgment um, based on their own uh, perceptions of how their horse is happy or not. And, and I think we've got to remember that um, in lots of ways uh, that the person that's spending the most amount of time with that horse, which is the owner, probably does know their behaviour best. And it can be very difficult um, if you're coming along saying, well, actually, he may not be happy for various reasons. So uh, it's an interesting word to use. I think it evokes quite strong emotions in people. But hopefully by a little bit of education, which Andrew's given us, we can maybe take a little bit more of a kind of broader view um, rather than perhaps just putting on those rose tinted glasses, which we do tend to do with our own horses. Yes, it's really interesting. I mean, Eileen, from, I mean, we obviously, World Horse Welfare rescues a lot of uh, equines that have had a pretty rough start in life. Um, and so one would imagine when they come into World Horse Welfare centres or, you know, come into a care, which is a good care compared to sort of poor care before. Can you see a change in those horses to, to, to potentially sort of unhappy horses arriving, turning into happy horses? Um, oh, I mean, it's a great question, this. Um, when I look back at, uh, at so many cases that come in, uh, whether they've come in from um, really quite uh, dubious welfare backgrounds, um, uh, just to give you an instance, I mean, just, um, you know, taking in what Andrew said, which I think encompasses so many things here, and I resonate so much there, um, just for looking at a case that we got in last year, where we had um, around uh, 14 colts coming in. They were born in a barn. They didn't know anything else. They were habituated in this barn. Their dams were taken away. They stayed in the barn. We took them out of this barn for various reasons, which I can't go into. And what we thought that they really need was to be able to be turned out, to become ponies out in the field, which we all think, because everybody's opinion is very much uh, taken on board, that's what we'd like to see. When we actually opened the doors to the outside world, those colts didn't actually know what to do. When they, when they had experienced the first time they had rain on their back, where did they go? They went scurling back into the, into the bar. That was a very interesting thing to do, where in a lot of cases that we have with semi ferals that's unhandled, indiscriminately bred ponies, and most of the time we're trying to catch them. Here we had a case where we had caught them and we were actually saying, go and be horse. And that in itself was really, uh, it opened my eyes to see how habituation had actually um, been put into those young beings at that time. And we're now trying to educate them to actually become what we think are horses. I yeah. mean, it, it's, yeah. you know, it's total reverse. Yeah. Um, so everybody's opinion matters. However, you know, there's always a case that's gonna come up and tell you something totally different. Yeah, you've got to be open to learn. Absolutely. Um, thank you. You've been brilliant on questions, but you're not being quite so brilliant if you're on Zoom. There's still quite a lot of questions going into the chat function. If you can put them in the Q&A function and then upvote those questions that you really like, that will be so much better. Now, 
Andrew, um, you know, around the world, horses are kept, when we think about their housing, they're kept in such different types of housing. When we think of uh, mixed species barn systems, individual stalls, horses living in front porches uh, uh, to being kept tethered under a tree. You know, is there a hierarchy of, of need, do you think? For example, is it, is it best to be free but alone or in company but restricted movement? Is it... Is it that simplistic? No, I don't think it is that simplistic, but uh, from my investigations and interest in social behaviour, I think that does rank very highly. I think a horse would be happier in company than just simply being alone, even if it had a vast environment. I, I, I think I'd wager that pretty strongly. And um, in terms of species, yes, I think that uh, you, we can substitute a horse for a a sheep and whatever, but it's, it, it, it will help. It won't be quite the same. Uh, the grooming may not be able to happen, but it certainly will help just to be uh, with something else. But ideally it's best, you know, I think the 10 out of 10 is just the normal social group that they're evolved to be with if possible, but that's very difficult. Um, but I think less so, but uh, further down the scale, just being with um, a group of horses and, and, and then maybe uh, further down, just two horses together. Whichever way, I, I think um, it's, it's really important to enable that kind of access if possible. I don't like our social animals being on their own. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Um, Brad, coming to you. Now, across the world, there are many stables and riding stables, riding schools within inner cities. Um, and obviously they would have limited turnout. How can these type of venues provide their horses best with a good quality of life, do you think? Yeah, I think it's, it's difficult and we certainly wouldn't want to come across as, as being opposed to those uh, stable yards because obviously they're, they're kind of doing a, a great job in themselves and I'm sure those horses um, are it, to a certain extent got all the needs that they require but having just listened to Andrew's presentation I think we now could be trying to do a bit more so looking at the bars between the stables and thinking about um, allowing horses to mutually groom um, I, I know there's some discussion about whether you know you can pair up every single horse and there are we know that some horses um, do have more of a you know a tendency to buddy up to another horse they don't all like each other but I think just giving an option for horses to mutually groom is a is a is a real opportunity. So even if you just give you know took took them around and and allowed them to mutually groom over the stable doors, I've seen that, and that just allows them to have that contact time, which is so important. I I, I think people like Andrew kept saying seeing other horses is not enough. They have to have that that touch and then that opportunity to actually mutually groom and picking up on the point that was just raised about um having horses out um i've got my horse out with two miniature shetlands and he can't mutually groom and i i do feel that 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 has an impact on his on his behavior that ability that you know he's not able to do that so um i think just allowing that access to each other is important even if it's not in, within a field environment yeah brilliant Thank you, Brad. Um, Andrew, I'm going to come back to you f uh, first, then I'll come to Eileen on the next one. But um, you mentioned, Andrew, the idea of enrichment uh, in a horse's stables. And, and I know um, when I've been chatting to a great friend of ours, Professor Natalie Warren, she always has a real concern around enrichment because people tend to, to use the term enrichment when they're actually actually covering up shortcomings of of you know f whether it be the, the social interaction and so, sometimes you can give yourself a cloak of the fact that, that the horse has a good sort of uh, quality of life because you provided this enrichment when actually it's missing a fundamental part of it, its um sort of uh, etiological needs so do, do you think enrichment you know the, the, the toys in uh, the, the the stables do they make a difference and and is there a danger that these interventions can mean that owners will miss some of the core needs of their horses yes i do i really agree with uh, nat's idea there i think it's very true that the um you know it's just it's a really piecemeal approach but it, it is one 
extra aspect, uh, but it is a small one. I don't think it's uh, by far the most important. I think the social aspect is more important. I, but I think the big problem there that I haven't mentioned and uh, it's worth thinking about is that we've really got to try to convince people that it, it won't be so bad um, it, it, when horses are together. Elke Hartmann uh, did a PhD on this in Sweden and she showed that horses only need to have an introduction through the, through the you know, bars of a yard for a short period of time to greatly reduce the risk of injury once they are put together. And of course, that's a bit of a blanket statement because um, obviously if horses have been isolated for a long time or if they're stallions, for example, there are other, other considerations, but it's really not going to be so bad. Once they're, for example, if we take the bars down to the stables, we found in every single case that uh, the, the horses' uh, aggression towards each other uh, diminishes markedly and it, they, um, their relationship is much more affiliative. But it is also important to think of having friends uh, grouped together, you know, because horses have preferences. And that's what they found at the, in the Manchester police that they needed to rearrange a few. And um, obviously that's just uh, good for the horse. And the more we do for horses, the better the outcomes are in every way. I believe that they would be better competitors in every area if you know the world the inner world is um accessed absolutely brilliant thank you andrew um eileen so do, do, i just we just wanted to pick up on the fact that uh, that's um a lot of the comments we got before this um webinar and we know that if we consider especially stallions at stud but not just that example but a lot of horses are kept in 24 7 um, and as an organization our field officers will often get called out to those uh, those type of cases and they can be really difficult to resolve as the horse is in good condition physically and is not overtly showing signs of distress so there's a limit to what we can do do you think that it is ever okay for a horse to be stabled 24 7. Okay, um, right, we do get uh, people concerned about uh, horses that are stable 24 7. Our, we take this quite seriously. Our field officer through our whole network throughout the UK will always follow up on these concerns. However, when one thinks how we would like our own horses to be kept might not be other people's opinions. And for our concerns that is the welfare of that horse compromised? We have to work within the law. And uh, luckily in the UK, we have laws uh, for animal welfare. There are many countries around the world that do not. However, we're dealing with uh, horses that are in the UK at the moment. Um, sometimes we have to think about how we can best um, help situations. Uh, there's always two sides to the story. When we look at the, the animal in question, we have to say, well, actually, does it have a good quality life? If the answer is yes, it's in good condition, it's stimulated, it's, an, it's been... Um, stimulated by interaction through their humans, etc. then what is the problem? Just because you might not think that that's how it should be kept, doesn't always fall in to how we can legally act. Saying that, we always want to be able to be open with everybody and there's two sides to the story and we do come across where people have come unstuck and the welfare is compromised. Changing people's attitudes and the way that they uh, keep their horses can take some time. Yeah. We don't just go away from it. We will work with people. There's always different ways to look after a horse. It could be cost restraints. It could be just mental attitudes. We have to, as field officers and the charity, we have to look at all the consequences and what is best for the horse at that time, is it compromised? Yes or no? No, move on, but let's see how else we can help. Yeah, brilliant. 
is a method of change. Thank you, Eileen. That's great. Brilliant. Listen, that's done the structured Q&A. We're now open Q&A. So just to remind you, there's a mountain of questions to get through here, team. So we're going to have to keep our answers nice and tight um, and we'll see how we do. So uh, eyes down. Here we go. Um, Brad, I'll come to you first. For a question from Facebook. If the horse has access to touching others in the field during the day, is that likely to be enough? So I assume that's actually as opposed to, you know, they're probably coming in at night and maybe they only can touch over a fence uh, line as opposed to actually being in the same field together. Do you think that would be enough? Um, yeah, I, I think we've got to put it into context, haven't we? Particularly at this time of year, horses aren't out 24-7. We've got the mud and, and, you know, the kind of the winter hopefully behind us. But I think is as much as you can do is is better than nothing um so yes i guess it is enough at the moment you have to kind of go with what you've got brilliant um andrew a question from linda uh, when stabling with touch options is it not necessary to have enough room to let them retreat from each other as well yes i think that's very important they need that choice to be able to get away you know just that's the problem with group housing, I think, is that often they can't get away um, as they would be able to in, in, in nature. So I think giving them the option to, you know, retreat or, or, or uh, when the need arises to groom is, is really important. Brilliant. Um, Eileen, Tara has asked, with increased education towards allowing more, allow horses more horse, horse contact, do you think in the future it might be called into question whether it is fair to ask horses to do things alone at all? For example, hacking out alone, could that be deemed poor welfare? Well, I think you have to, uh, I'll go to kind of phrase of conditioning what you want the horse to do. Um, it is also that I mean, there's a lot of willingness that comes from the horse and it comes down to the basic training of that. If you are expecting something that the horse is not used to doing, then it's going to react. It's not, it's going to go back to the herd. It will either buck you off or run away and it'll go back to the yard to where it knows. But it's through your training in the building blocks of being able to take that horse forward to be confident with its rider or driver, in the case may be, or in, the, in, in a different world, is the, the working, working horse, then it will be conditioned to be able to do that. So it's a bond between the human and the horse. But you cannot expect the horse just to do something yeah. at, at your whim. You've got to communicate with it what you would like to do with it. So it's all education on both sides, really. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Brad, Leonora has asked, um, this is where horses are a bit like people maybe, how detrimental to a horse's welfare is being next door to an equine neighbour they really don't like? I've often thought about this when horses are being transported in a small space with little chance to get away. Um, I, I think it's I think it's very stressful for horses. I think you, we've all seen horses get particularly worked up. Maybe they're kind of kicking the walls or kicking the partition between a horse that they don't um, appear to get on well with. I think it does sort of induce a negative emotion it, with within them, and I think we probably need to take that into account and and find a horse that they they are comfortable being next to. So. As Andrew said, we, we, evidence is out there to suggest that horses do have preferred um, pals that they, they like to be with. So, yeah, I think it can be very stressful for a horse. I was reminded me earlier, Andrew, when you were talking about language and the fact that uh, an English horse could probably understand uh, a German horse. I only wish I could go to Germany, understand German. But there you go. <laughs> I'm, rubbish at, I'm rubbish at languages. Um, so James asked Andrew, um, could, could Andrew give you his view on whether barn-style stabling would be a better option for a happy horse rather than individual stables or stalls? But what are the negatives? But I think, well, in many respects, it, it, it is compared to a single stalls where we presume that the horse, you know, can't 
touch another horse and sometimes can't even see. Hopefully that those days are gone. But um, the problem with a barn style arrangement is that a horse, if there are some problems, some social issues there, then a horse can't get away. So that needs to be dealt with. I think a barn style situation is um, a group housing, as we call it, is an ideal situation, except for th that aspect that they, you know, they need to be able to make a choice to, you know, groom or to get away. That I think they're the, that's the major thing. Otherwise, it's a, it's it's a very good thing as long as there's enough space and they're not overcrowded, of course. Brilliant, um, excellent. Thank you for that. Um, Eileen, Sharon's asked, I'm curious about your thoughts on turning horses out at night and stabling during the day, because St studies show that horses move more at night time than they do during the day. What are your thoughts on that? Well, um, haven't really, to be honest, haven't. it's not something that's on top of my uh, thought process there, but you're absolutely right. When I think about turning horses out, now why am I bringing horses in during the day? Is it because I want to work them or is it I want to take them in for some other reason? Or when I want to turn them out or am I working during the day? Um, there's all different variations. When do I hear the horses running around more? Yes, in the dusk, in the dawn or dawn and dusk. Um, when they would be in the wild, that's when they would start moving about an awful lot more, uh, looking for their next uh, part of uh, feeding or when they're needing their next drink, etc. Um, are they happier outside during the night? I actually have to ask them. I'm not yeah. quite sure, to be honest. But it's an interesting thought. Um, but when it looks like uh, turning them out at night, you have to watch about the dawn. Are you going to get up enough, uh, early enough to be able to bring them in? Because we've got to think about new grasses growing through, especially in this part of the hemisphere. Um, and things like, you know, are we going to yeah. get caught out? What, yeah. Why, why are we thinking that? Yeah. Brilliant. Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. The, I think I, Aileen's, Aileen's right about that. Um, I think it's just really our tradition that, you know, because we're daytime animals that sleep at night, but horses are the other way around. And most prey animals are because most predators attack during the night. That's the most, you know, common time of attack. So they need, that's why, you know, horses have ex excellent nighttime black and white vision, more a more rod dominated uh, retina than cones, like uh, as we do, where we have very good trichromatic vision. We can see red and green. Uh, in particular, uh, as separate colours. And, you know, I think that's uh, just a tradition that we have. And I think that there's something in that where uh, horses, you know, we maybe we do it the wrong way around. But it's, but it's expedient, isn't it? Yeah. That's the reason. Br br brilliant. Um, Brad, I don't know, you might bat this back across to Andrew, but someone on Facebook's asked uh, about equine facilitated facilitated learning. Um, what advice would you give on directing independent researchers towards robust indicators for horse well-being, such as heart, heart rate, facial expressions, etc.? Yeah, I think this is a you know really interesting question. I, I think the biggest thing that that um, we teach certainly at the vet school to the to the students when we're doing a lot of the horse handling uh, practicals is the importance of using the neck scratch. So we know that that just scratching at the base of the neck replicates that mutual grooming and it does lower the heart rate. So if we're thinking about keeping a horse um, in a kind of more, uh, you know, it, if I use the expression happier state or if improving their well-being, then a simple thing that we can be doing um, is just scratching the base of the neck. And, and I think what we do know is it is it as well as lowering the heart rate, it clearly lowers their arousal levels. So looking for facial expressions we're looking for those horses instead of their heads being up high um, maybe they're moving around tail swishing etc those horses will be a lot more relaxed with lower arousal level signs so you know standing still with a droopy lower lip so I think you can you can do a bit of an ethogram so you can look for those indicators of arousal levels and actually if you just stand there and scratch the base of the neck um, often that those will improve so it's yeah. quite a simple thing to do. Brilliant. 
Thank you. Um, Andrew, Emma Louise has asked, more aimed at the idea of allowing horses at competition to be able to touch, but how would you weigh up the protection of horses from different yards in terms of biosecurity over temporary happiness while staying away, assuming they have access to interact with horse when they're at their home stables? Well, that's a very difficult one. Uh, um, it's probably easier in Australia because we don't have such uh, biosecurity issues as, as we do in uh, Europe. Um, my son has a barn in Germany and uh, I mean, it's much more significant there. I, I still think um, it's worth having social contact, but at competitions, many, especially big ones, many people have more than one horse anyway, and those horses do know each other. So there's no biosecurity issue uh, in their own stables. Um, and maybe in competitions, it, it may not be a good idea from a, and that's really more, that question is more in Brad's area than mine, but uh, it may not be uh, a good idea to, for them to have contact with each other uh, in, in, you know, in Europe and uh, elsewhere where there are biosecurity issues. Yeah. But I just think where possible, give them wherever possible um, on the balance of probabilities that, that's, uh, that the biosecurity issue isn't such a big deal, I think give them access to each other. Brilliant. Uh, Brad, any thoughts on that? Yeah, the only thing I was going to add as well is that the, the value of these horses. So a lot of these competition horses are worth huge amounts of money. And I think that there's a real kind of nervousness about allowing these horses to interact um, one kick. Um, can can literally finish a horse's career or worse or you know like we talked about biting etc injuries these horses are worth a lot of money and I think people are are, are kind of nervous about the risk of an injury so yeah but I suppose as, as, as Andrew's already picked up sometimes that I mean you can understand that risk but it's not always well founded and actually it, it can be the, the less risky option to allow them that interaction uh, so yeah. that's a, that, yeah, that's a really good point, Brad. Um, Eileen, um, Andrew has been, been a little uh, greedy. He's asked two questions. I'll give you the first one. If horses cannot see, if they can see one another, but they cannot interact, does that serve as a bigger negative on the horse? So you're sort of dangling social sort of contact in front of them, but they can't actually interact with each other, sort of groom each other. What, what, do, do you have a view on that and experience in terms of? I, I actually think it can have a, a negative reaction to it. Um, when I think back uh, of, all right, I'm going back decades here, where I came from, I came from a competition background, blah, 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 instructional. I stabled horses. I put them, at, put them at prized possessions. They were worth a lot of money. They couldn't touch each other. They couldn't interact with each other. Is that because that's how I was taught? I have changed over the last 30 years. We started off at Bell Wade. You only have to look up YouTube and see what Bell Wade looks like. Uh, for those that don't understand where I'm coming from, um, we used to get horses in, we'd put them in stables, they'd be they'd have afflictions, whether they're lame, etc. The last thing they needed to do was actually go into a 12 by 12 or 12 by 14 or just give them bigger stable, didn't matter. The last thing they needed was actually being stuck on their own. They needed interaction. They needed to become a horse. Yeah. We'd get horses that would come in with days, um, seven days worth of rugs, um, piles of feeding, everything else. This is what they had to do, whole diary of what they had. And the poor horse would just think, now what? And I would, I might hope ethos change these horses need to become horses again or be, or to find out that they are actually horses and turning them out giving them more space giving them more interaction with each other uh, and just mentioned about police horses i've had dealings with another police force where they were always isolated unless they were working changing their ethos giving them interaction with each other giving them turnout and becoming horses again actually uh, lengthened their the working lifespan and also uh, taking that in then looking at 
um, other people's opinions and way of teach uh, of keeping yeah. horses. We adapted Bell Wade of open big barn systems yeah. and being able to interact. Brilliant. Which one would I like now? After all this, I'd rather have the interactive in social uh, herds rather than being stuck in a box. Brilliant. That's Thank you. Opinion. Um, and Andrew, um, Andrew's had a second part of the question. I quite like this. Having worked in racing, I've seen horses get loose and gallop maybe 300 metres back to the yard and their own specific box. Would they not do this if they didn't feel happy and secure? Well, yeah, see, I think that's why it's a very difficult question. I, I agree that they, I've seen that so many times. And uh, I, I, when uh, I ran the Australian Equine Behaviour Centre, all our paddocks had boxes in them and many horses that uh, preferred to be in the box. Um, and so I think that through selective breeding, it's not just as simple as saying that, you know, stabling is bad uh, altogether. But by the same token, um, I think um, the isolation is the, is the, is the critical thing. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a, it, it, it's a problem to be uh, only in a box, but yeah. if horses have had the access, they'll often choose to be. And if they've had more time in a box through their own habituation, they probably will uh, like to be there for some period of time. Brilliant. Thank you. Can be a safe place. Yes, a place of safety. Absolutely. Um, Brad, uh, Penny's asked, you mentioned anthropomorphism. I think I mentioned it. Uh, do you have an opinion as to whether it's getting worse or better over time? And why do you think that is? Um, I think it's difficult to answer. I think we've always been like that with our pets. I, I don't think it's something that's necessarily changed. Uh, I think we've always talked as owners about our dogs, our horses, in that kind of anthropomorphic way. And I think in a way, in a way, that's because we take great comfort from our animals and we see them as our friends and we want to do the best for them. And we think that if it makes us happy, then it's going to definitely make them happy. So I don't think it's something that's necessarily um kind of got worse um but i'd like to think we're more aware of it now and, and perhaps we're actually putting a, a a label to it so we're understanding what we're doing and actually some of the negative effects that it can have rather than the positive effects which we we thought we were achieving which as we're understanding we we probably weren't so yeah. i think it's always been there because it's that companionship that we we get from our animals Brilliant. Um, I mean, I, I mentioned it earlier, isn't it? You know, the, the fact that um, uh, horses uh, need that that the friends, freedom, and forage, sort of. Uh, and in regards to um, you know, anthropomorphism, you know, w when we think about horses and rugs, for example, and Eileen's example of uh, a horse coming out with seven rugs, when actually it probably doesn't need any of them. Um, uh, do, do you see that in your practice, the fact that, that's, that, that, that there's still a real challenge there? Yeah, and I think I think that, you know, then there comes um, problems from that. So we see horses that um, are overweight, for example, because we all know that horses should be losing weight in the, in the winter and, and then gaining it in the spring and summer. And a lot of these horses are warmer in the winter than they are perhaps, you know, any other time of the year because yeah. we've got so many rugs on them. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, I think we see the kind of knock-on effect of anthropomorphic behaviour all, all the time. And uh, I've seen horses, um, you know, we were talking about enrichment um, kind of toys or, or, and literally I've seen that on yards where people have kind of hung fluffy, cuddly toys outside um, horses' stables because they think that that's, that's appropriate because it's their favourite toy and, and actually it, it's, it's not. They'd be better looking at something like a mirror. So, yeah, I think we need to kind of look at lots of these things and, and maybe start to try and see things through the horse's eyes rather than our own. Yes. Brilliant. Um, Eileen, here's a nice question for you from Christiana. Is it not better to transform the industry and keep them into in little herd communities? So do, do, I mean, you've talked about sort of barn stabling, uh, crew, crew yards, um, and actually just, I, I assume to just ditch it, let's do away with stables. 
<laughs> Keep them in a little community. Okay, in the ideal world, um, but not everybody can do that. Um, so we, uh, you have to ask yourself, why are we having a horse? What do we want to do with the horse? Um, or is it just an encumbrance and I have to deal with it? And therefore I will stick a toy in its stable and I'll be happy for the next 24 hours. Or am I actually going to look properly after this particular horse in isolation? Or can I, in the ideal world, but if you have a nice little herd, that would be great. But not everybody can do that. Yeah. So um, you have to look at the horse as an individual, really, and do the best you can for that. If, you, if it becomes too much for you, then you have to question, should you have it in the first place? Yeah. Sorry, I'm being very blunt there. No, but sure. um, okay. in an ideal world, you know, we'd all like to think that we can uh, set our horses free in, you know, X number of acres and they'd all be happy. Brilliant. Thank, Thank you. Well. Um, we're, get, we're getting to quarter past the hour. So we're um, getting quite, So we're going to have to speed up, chaps uh, and chaffesses. We're going to have to sort of nice short answers. Um, a question, Andrew, from Orsolia. I, I hope I've pronounced that name right. Um, she, and says really supports the, the, the such stable designs, but has a real, Andrew, concerned about um, wondering about the safety of these new stable designs and whether horses can get their feet stuck in them easily if they buckle rear up um, and how safe these new stable designs that you were talking about really are. Well, yeah, I think well, that's a good point, but I do think you can design them so that if a horse happens to rear up over the top, um, its feet can slide easily uh, over the top, you know, so that it's, I think that's just part of safe stable design. I discussed this with uh, with Luke Jones, and that was one thing that he mentioned was um, that safety aspect, but that's true in all stabling. But the thing is, if horses have good social contact, you're highly unlikely to get rearing. You know, all of the, this is what we have experienced with the results of uh, this more open sided stables is that um, well, of course, they can't kick each other because, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the upper levels and the bars being removed or, or modified, but um, it's just so, so much uh, karma in all, all respects. So, you know, the, I think it's, a, uh, it's, it's a high, more unlikely to have feet stuck in problems. Yeah. There's less, much less box walking with when horses have social touch access. Brilliant. Um, Brad, Chelsea's asked, what's your opinion on group housing systems? I think they're a great idea. I, I love the idea of them kind of being in a, in a herd, in a, in a loose um, crew yard type of housing. But you need to be careful of, you couldn't just go and select six horses that had never kind of had any contact with each other and throw them in together and expect everything to potentially be okay. You need to perhaps do it in a more staged process. So um, yes, I think it's a great idea, but you just need to be kind of a little bit strategic about how you do it and set set it up for success. Um, and then I think it's a really good move. Brilliant. Um, Eileen, Emma's asked um, what, a series of questions, one of which is be interested to know if you need to be able to get away from their stable mates at times as well and i think we've already said yes they need to be the size of the box needs to be such that they can but emma's also asked is do you recommend having the ability to touch horses on both sides of them or does that not matter i think it really does come down to the individual horse i mean they all have their own characters and I think watching and learning how your each horse actually interacts with one another, you can tell where their happy their happy place is. I mean, there are some horses that um, can't cope with both sides or three sides if you're having a you know in various barn systems, um, giving them enough space to get away from each other. They, uh, I remember. Um, or on travels, etc. You know, I was told by a prominent trainer, a racehorse trainer, don't look over, don't over my horse's door. They're not goldfish. Give them space. And I think 
And I thought, oh, oh, sorry about that. I was just looking and seeing what a lovely horse that is. But actually, that rang true. So, and that was quite a few years ago. Actually, give them their own space at, at a point. I love the system that Andrew's thinking about, but each to their own individual. Watch, learn from your animals. See how they interact. See and learn from them. That's my key thing. Not everybody's the same. Uh, no, um, normally I wouldn't go to queue at the chat function, but Rosalind's asked quite a challenging question. And Brad, I thought I'd, I'd put this to you. Unfortunately, until livery yard owners start to change, we are stuck. Do, the, do you ever see UK yards? And what's on offer for the everyday owner in a UK livery yard? I think it is really difficult because you're kind of, um, uh, you know, have to abide by the rules of the livery yard in terms of turnout. We know that throughout winter, most livery yards would expect horses to be in. Um, but I think that there are liveries, your livery yards out there that, that do kind of acknowledge the importance of social interaction and will um, allow horses to go out in pairs or in threes. Um, so I think it, if you kind of look for those yards, they, they are available, but I do understand the, the difficulties that, that, that there can be in trying to find those kind of you know, housing environments. And certainly I always felt in practice, you would see a certain number of horses that as you kind of finish the summer months, then you moved into that winter housing that you would see kind of behavioral problems develop as you took a, a group of horses that have been together in a herd and then locked them up individually for um, 24 hours. And, and that there was a, I always felt like a kind of influx in owners concerned about their horses behavior during that transition. So yeah, I appreciate it's tough. Brilliant. Um, and I hope that some of the, the, the things that we've discussed tonight, you know, are very relevant to, to livery yard, um, but horses kept in livery yards uh, as opposed to anywhere else. But it's a really good question. Thank you for that. Um, the question I've missed, I've now lost it. Um, uh, uh, Andrew, uh, question, do you think a horse's happiness as a stable depends on its lifestyle as a youngster? For example, if a horse was stable for all of its life after being weed, would they weaned, would they know any different? Do they become institutionalized? They do, but I think what we also have to remember is that um, all horses have, you know, born, we call it their telos, you know, their certain genetic predispositions to behave in certain ways. And, and these needs, like social needs and needs for exercise and needs for foraging are hardwired. Um, but they can be uh, messed up and suppressed in all sorts of ways. And it's the same, you know, we see the same with human psychosis. So if a horse has been weaned too early, which is very common, that's something that should change. I think we wean them far too early. We take them away from their mother when they should really be still interactive with their mother and um, uh, to some extent the social group, but particularly their mother. When uh, they've only been raised in a stable yes they they will feel more comfortable in the stable but they're not wired to be like that so my answer is give them access and they will start to uh utilize it I, in most cases some of them never do in in my experience we've had a few very odd ones through the australian equine behavior center um that never did but generally they do and um I think that, you know, sometimes it takes time to allow a horse to be a, a horse. But to my mind, the whole question of happiness is about, you know, looking from an animal welfare perspective, a, giving an animal a life worth living. And so that's what we should think of rather than the humanistic point of view of, you know, what's a lovely stay with gold knobs and all of that. What, what are the needs of the horse? And if, even if he's had a messed up early beginning, start to allow these basic uh, genetic drives to show up. Brilliant. Andrew, thank you very much. Um, Brad, the question from Facebook, um, I really like this one, maybe uh, we might have to finish up on this one, but can a human compensate and take the place of another horse by interacting with their horse on a daily basis? They say that their horse has had a lack of direct contact with other horses, although he can see them. He's had a lot of box rest due to many health issues but he appears to be very happy with his life. So can a human provide that social interaction for a horse? Um, I think that there's a lot that the human 
can do. So I, I think that just providing that stimulation by, and as I described earlier about doing, a, you know, a neck scratch, um, that kind of thing is was all really important. And it's something that kind of um, we know that the horse is going to respond to. Um, and and actually just, you know, making sure that you exercise your horse, give it exercise, um, you know, freedom to move around. I, I think that the point is that um, no, that, that a human can't replace another horse, but there are lots of things that you could probably do to kind of help. But I don't know if Andrew's got a comment on this, but I, I, I don't think we can ever really think that we're, we're, we're doing the, the job of a, a, a field companion or another horse, really. But I don't know, Andrew, have you Andrew, got any comment? thoughts on that? Yeah, um, I, I think... Well, I agree with Brad. I think the, what we can do is do as much physical contact. And that's where grooming has always been good for horses. You know, it's not just about cleaning their coats. And that's why massage is so big. It's very good for horses. And there's all sorts of massage equipment you can buy, thero guns and whatever. They're, they're good. It's, uh, it, uh, I think that's important to uh, have that. Um, as far, and the bond between humans and horses, that can be very strong. I just think it's worth remembering that regardless we're just not with horses 24 seven, like my, we may be with dogs where they're in our house, perhaps um, with horses, you know, they're, they're largely on their own during the most active times of their lives where at night time. So yeah, we can have a good uh, bond with them, but I don't think it replaces it enough. Yeah. Brilliant. Listen, um, thank you very much. We have got through all questions on uh, Q&A that have been upvoted uh, at least three times. I, I'm really sorry we couldn't get through everything. Um, but we've, as ever, with the, the, there's been so much that we've discussed. Eileen, I'll come to you first. You know, having heard Andrew's presentation, having heard the, 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 the discussion we've had, what, what's your final sort of take-home thought, take-home message, final thought? Uh, my final thought is we're always learning. We, so many of us think we know everything, but actually uh, when we open our minds, there's so much we can learn and actually make our horses, our animals' lives so much better. Yes, brilliant. Brad, what are your final thoughts? Um, it was something Andrew said about, uh, I think it was some research about actually horses, they only need a kind of minimal amount of time to touch noses uh through bars and actually and if you kind of don't get any unwanted behaviors they will be okay as field companions and the, the relative risk is quite low and i think for a lot of competition clients who are nervous about their horse because of its value etc um to kind of be able to echo that and make them a bit braver in making that leap of let's just put them together is is really important so yeah if people could take that home that'd be great Excellent. Love it. And, and Andrew? Well, I think the take home message is, you know, try and give your horse, you'll get the best out of your horse, whatever you do with it, even if it's just companionship um, or at the other end of the scale, a serious sport, if we do enable horses to access their basic instinctual drives and socialization is one thing that we definitely move past. We, we've got to get past the idea that just seeing a horse is enough. I think, you know, there's so much like humans in that uh, touches us and physical contact is a very important part. So that's, that's really my main message. And also to educate people that it is uh, going to be okay. Um, it's always surprising to people when they do do it. The common thing that they tell me is, um, oh, I, I, um, when you told me, I really didn't believe it, but it's, it's amazing. The horses are just fine. Because you know, they, it's like dogs on a chain. When they're on the chain next to each other, they look so like, aggressive and they're going to kill each other. But actually, when the chain's off, it's quite different. I think that the chain and the restriction, uh, it tells you something. It makes a big difference to their lives in the restriction. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, listen, um, thank you. Thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Some lovely comments coming through. Um, and so um, Andrew, Brad and Eileen, um, and a special thank you to Andrew for joining us at such an early hour, but to all three of you, that was that really was fantastic. So I ca cannot thank you enough. Just do remember this recording will be available on our YouTube channel later on in a couple of hours, as are all our other webinars. Um, do rem 
email us at education at worldtalkswelfare.org for any suggestions you have on what we might cover um, on future webinars. And remember, 23rd of March, two weeks time with Amber and Joe. No gut, no horse. Why gut bugs are essential for optimum health and behaviour. So with that, um, thank you so much again uh, to our three panellists. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Take great care uh, in this extraordinary mad world we live in. And I hope to see many of you in two weeks time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.